So let me go through this last uh, section here and then go to a demo and then we're done for the day. So primarily this is where we started hitting problems last night and starting to do some debug information. Uh, in this module I want to talk about how to get a dump and the k exec k dump process. It's already configured, we don't have to worry about it. I do want to use the crash command briefly. Now Floyd 1 has a, a real crash on it and I sent you the PV and the bug report. And uh, it is, if you go off onto DMZ server in that lab tarball thing, I dumped it off there as dump 3. So there are three dumps that we can look at in this class. One is just an idle system that was dropped to KDB and dumped. One was a panic from a, a, a module I have specifically designed to panic. And then the third one's a real world one. So the other thing we want to talk about is dropping into KDB. And then lastly, what to do to get information. So KExec basically replaces the older LKCD that we've used in the Itanium world. Uh, LKCD was kind of a uh, Cray SGI spinoff. KExec KDump is now a community solution. Uh, even Itanium now is KExec KDump. Now you do need to be running the latest kernel. The vanilla slash 11 SP1 kernel does not properly dump. So KExec dump basically is booting into new kernel. We don't want to use a currently running kernel to dump because we can't trust the current kernel in case it's corrupted. So basically it's loading a uh, second kernel. I don't want to call it a panic kernel. It loads a second kernel into the system. And remember in elado.conf we talked about crash equals, which specifies where the second kernels get loaded. Uh, basically it is providing tools to get a dump when we get a panic or an oops. I'm not sure that I like that either. Key packages, kexec tools, the kdump command, the crash command, and then we do need a debug info RPM. Uh, in older days we didn't need that, but with the kdump thing, crash needs that debug info file. And there is a, uh, a script. Now, kexec and kdump are invoked by a panic. I'd like to try to do that. Uh, if we're at the kdb prompt, we can do a kdump, and that will get a dump. If, I, if I'm uh, catastrophic in kdb and type in a go, that can also give me a dump or bring me back to the live system. I can also echo a C into proc sysrq trigger or a power NMI, so that's one, two, three, four, five different ways that I might invoke a dump. Unfortunately, that perf top has blocked and masked all NMI capability and escape KDV. So when we hit that perf top, only UV dump will work. So I want to do some of that. So KDump is a KXF based kernel dump mechanism uses kexec to boot into a new kernel. The new kernel captures the dump and it dumps it off basically to swap. And in that process, a tool to manage that dump uh, called make dump file during the boot process. Basically, it's going to compress it. Now, kdump again requires kexec kdump and uh, make dump file. There's a script in the init.d for boot k dump. We have to set up an, uh, that crash variable in our elado.conf, and there's an issysys config k dump. So, again, this is old syntax, right? I need to clean that up. But in elado.conf, x is the amount of memory reserved, and y is the, the load location. So, I guess they're kind of showing it here. Is that right? Yeah, here's the newer syntax. It specifies a range rather than just a starting point. So Mike was talking about that as well. 
So the crash kernel size can be seen in the file varlog uvconfig, uvconfig.log. You can also see it in your cat proc command line. Now it is all set up by default and working. However, at this point, you're going to have to do a manual reset. Let me show you that. So 14.8 is just showing the uh, sysconfig uh, kdump file contents, how many old dumps to keep, things of that sort. Now the dump files are in two places, basically var crash, but it's also linked into var log dumps. So in var crash, you've got year, month, date, hour, minute. And I did get a crash last night on Floyd 1. Check your systems, too. So basically, we've got a normal operating system. We configure our crash dump parameters. We get some sort of crash dump initiated by a panic. And oops and a panic are the same thing. Or, or, a, or an operator administrator request. Case exec then switches to the kdump kernel. And then uh, during the boot process, kdump is going to save an image of the system to the disk and then build our crash directory files. And one thing nice is they are saving the crash command and the kernel. You don't get just the dump. That way, if an engineer is looking at your system, they don't have to try to recreate that same kernel so that the crash and the dump and the symbol tables all match. And then the system reboots automatically with the normal kernel. And during the reboot process, it should be cleaning it up. I'm going to have to double check this to make sure that uh, this is correct. So to invoke kdump only from kdb, uh, do not invoke it from the command line. So basically, we go into kdb by hitting escape kdb. So esc and then uppercase kdb invokes kdb. Then you can do a go to get back to the OS, if not catastrophic. So here we actually see a dump being created. So here's the make dump file that's trimming it all off. And notice, mounting it, this should be swap here, it's mounting it on swap. And during the reboot process, it'll get moved from swap to var crash. So to look at this uh, dump with crash, you need to have that debug info file. It also gives me interactive access on the machine, displays information about leading up to a system crash. Basically, what we're looking at is what's called a stack trace or a backtrace. Now when you're looking at a trace back or a backtrace, the, the, the stack is basically my caller callee subroutine stack. Every time I jump to a routine, I save the prior routine's environment on the stack and I might jump, 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 and have three environments on the stack. And then when I exit out of that deep routine, I use the stack to get back to where I was. So it's jumps and returns that result in stack activity in general. So a crash can look at data from a dump or a live system, and we can generate a quick report. Now it says crash is not loaded by default, but we are getting crash loaded by default right now. That might be an X, uh, ICE type of system. I'm not sure if SGI base configuration is doing that or it's just in the default list now. So I'm not worried about that. It, it is being loaded. It was not in Temple where this uh, pr presentation originally came from. So in that directory, we're going to have a readme file. We're going to have a system map for symbol tables. We're going to have a core and we're going to have the, uh, the actual debug and then the kernel. So they got a crash year CD into that directory and looked at it. I want to do that on ours. Parses input lines. Crash is going to take command line arguments. 
has command line editing. I can grep and more and things like that within Crash. So it brought up Crash, and the very first thing after it brings things up, it says, here's what we got. Okay, so here's our kernel. This is looking at a live system. This was in July. Number of tasks, the node name. And it looks like here it was looking at itself. It saw itself running. Uh, they CD'd into this directory and ran crash. So here we need the system map, the default, and the core. Now I'm not sure why they're doing it this way. So we've got the system map, the kernel, debug info, and the core. And looking at this one, this one actually was some sort of oops. And check the log, check bar log messages for a reason for the oops. Okay, let's see. There is a help showing the different things. Again, BT is a key one here. Uh, PS, print. Let's see. Not seeing print. What am I thinking of? Uh, what is we use a lot to look at a structure? the struct command, task command, that's the one I'm looking for. So the task command actually prints out the process table or the, the task table. Structure will print out a particular structure and what is will tell you what that structure looks like. So there are a couple of sys as well. Let's see where was sys right here. So we're just going to go through a couple of these. So here's the sys output. Uh, it's kind of been trimmed here for the panic that's down at the bottom. Looks like this was July 18th. Looks like the same one we had a few slides ago. Then here's a PS command. Anybody that's used the older L crash, the newer crash is a lot nicer. A PS works more conveniently. This is basically the offset, the memory address of the process table entry for that particular process. And when they have brackets, those are kernel threads. Then here's the task command, so we're putting in a PID, and now we can actually look at the process table entry, in this case for the shell, and things like uh, priorities and stuff like that. There's our priority, but it's always going to be the same. Now this is the important one, is being able to do a backtrace. Now they picked a silly one here, but it looks like they were in bash, and they wrote into sysrq trigger. So this uh, particular panic or crash was created by an echo c into slash proc slash sysrq underscore trigger. And in uh, the tarball there is one that is just a, a k dump from kdb and another one that's a panic. And uh, I should probably get an nmi example as well. But when we're looking at stack trace, we kind of want to read it from the bottom up. So here we see a system call being made. It was writing. It was writing into a slash proc. In particular, it was writing into sysrq slash trigger. There is a utility called SGI collect dump, and this allows you to upload things to shell so that uh, the call center and engineering can look at it, and you can put in things like the case ID and stuff like that. Just makes it easier to get these dumps off to an SGI uh, server where engineering can look at it. So they ran a uh, user SBIN SGI collect dump here. The other piece is KDB. Now when you go into KDB, this is a kernel debugger, it stops the system. It freezes the running system. If I was in the middle of a VI, everything would stop. I'd think the system is hung. It basically is hung. But if I type in go, that VI interactive connection should come back, assuming nothing catastrophic happened while you were in KDB. You have to get it over a serial console or a front end. Again, we're primarily using it to debug kernel hangs. And again, to exit KDB is a go. And if it's catastrophic, Go will just force a dump. Now, KDB has some macros in it. The one that we care about is ArchKDB. 
Basically, that's what engineering would want. These other macros are called from ArchKDB. So basically, when I get a dump or get a uh, problem, I might drop into KDB. I did this last night. Uh, if you go to that PV that I gave you, you can go off and find the ArchKDB output and the LCrash output. And I've also dumped them off into Dump-3 on DMZ server where the uh, course lab tarball is. Uh, SysRQ I don't care about. So SysRQ, you basically enable it here, and here we can echo one in it, but there isn't a whole lot I can do from uh, SR. So here at SR question mark shows the different uh, options that you can do. Uh, SRQ was meant more, for, SysRQ was meant more for when KDB was not implemented. Uh, x86 hasn't had KDB in the past and hasn't even had much with KDump, KExec. So creating a system when system is hung. This will reboot the system. Generate a kernel dump with SysRQ. What's wrong with this? If the system's hung, you can't do it. So what you need to do is, is escape KDB and then run KDump. Again, I would do an arch KDB. One thing, and I'll try to emphasize this, when I have a uh, KDB, I get out and come back in with SSH. It's all personal preference. Uh, root at Floyd-CMC. But I will then pipe it into TEE and then use some sort of date and time. So everything that goes to my console that I'm seeing is being dumped in this file. And then when I do the arch KDB, all the output would be in that file. If you're working from Windows or something, the hard part is how, how, what's the history, how far back can uh, whatever your putty, for example, how far back can it go in history. And that's it for the presentation. I haven't looked at this yet. Well, this looks like it might be useful. Uh, there's a good chance the dump that I got last night might be a case study for the class as well. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>